Thank you very much, Brother it's a great privilege to be here in this Christian assembly tonight, yes. down here in this uh, icy country. And, uh, <laughs> I called home a while ago, and it's about 20 degrees warmer way up there in the north than it is down here. I must have brought that with me. I, I, I'll hurry out and get back again right quick. Uh, all the plants are freezing up. What do you think about that creature? It's, an, an, it's cold. It certainly is. and so happy to get to meet this fine pastor tonight and to see you people. I've just been in a few moments. I come up from Tucson where I had to go today. Drove down last night and got in about 2.30 this morning down in Tucson and then was up all day down there and left just a few moments. Well, I got in, just been in about an hour and a half, I guess, something like that, up here. And so I haven't had too much sleep. <laughs> But I'll try not to go to sleep here. <laughs> um, but we're we're happy to to be here. Uh, this little boy playing around these microphones here. <laughs> I sat down back there on the one of the little children's seat. Little boy come look at me real strange. I said, "All of us kids can sit together, can't we?" <laughs> I sure love them little fellows, though, and it's um, oh, it's really nice to be here tonight, and I have this fine audience of people standing around, and I trusting now that Brother Williams has told you all about and Brother Rose here about the oncoming convention. I guess you're well acquainted with it. Uh, to be at the Ramada uh, right away, the businessman's convention. And we're expecting a great time there. Brother Valma Gardner, a wonderful, forceful speaker, and other ministers, or Roberts, and many will be there. And we're expecting a great time in the law. I hope some of these times let's have a healing service in that place. I'd like to get Brother Oral and we get together. Yes, sir. Wouldn't that be just fine? That would be to... A regular breaking in for it, wasn't it? a healing service down in the Ramada. That would be fine. Uh, we, uh, so we might do that, you know. The Lord might provide that for us. I have a healing service. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're going around now from church to church to try to spread the good tidings and to associate one with another and have fellowship in all the different churches. That's what we believe in, yes, that we are one in Christ. I was speaking the other day to a, a doctor. I'm fixing to leave for overseas, and you have to have a physical examination. So I was in for an examination. He put me on one of those wave. I don't ask me what it is. And he found something strange, and he come back and couldn't make it out. And he got a council of doctors, and he just couldn't understand that. He said, "I never seen that before." And so he showed me the picture of it, how that where ordinarily uh, the conscience, and you have a subconscious, and they are way wide from each other. But he noticed on mine is both right together. <laughs> I said, you're a real odd fella. I said, I've always known that. Yeah. There, <laughs> <laughs> I said, we've never seen that before. So he got to telling me about it. And I said, well, I said, you know, I guess the good Lord, when he makes us up, he just makes us a little different. We don't look like one another. And so sometimes we don't even act like each other. But, but um uh, he makes it to him his own way of making it. We just go into the big molding machine and we'll just sit still. He'll mold us the way he wants us to be. And I, I know no one would want to be anything but what you are. Only thing that we all can desire after we have been saved and become the children of God, the only thing we want is just a little closer walk each day. That's what we long for, for that great fellowship. How wonderful it is. Would you ever stop to think, uh, just what would we do if we didn't have that? What, 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 if that great hope didn't rest in us, what would we do? I was saying in one of the churches, maybe, uh, first one place or another and around the 
country, I make a remark sometimes, think I might repeat it in the same church. But I was going out of the building where I'd been kind of laying pretty heavy about these people today doing this year new dance they got they call the twister or something. And um, I said, I just don't know what the world people want to break their legs and, and, and act like that for. Yeah. So there was a, a fellow about 26, 27 years old, met at the bank. I said, just a moment, Mr. Branham. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, you just don't understand. I said, I hope I never do. So he said, um, you see, he said, I can see your point. He said, you're a man 50 years old, but if you was my age, it would be different. I said, wait a minute. I said, I was preaching the gospel when I was 10 years younger than you. I still believe that same gospel. I found something that takes the place of more joy in serving the Lord than all the things that the devil could manufacture anywhere. It's a, it gives a satisfaction. You know, David said one time, as the heart thirsts for the water broke, my soul thirsts after thee, O God. And if you ever seen it, one of the little fellows when he's, he's been hurt, Maybe the dogs has got a hold of him and jerked a big piece out of his side or something. He's bleeding. And he, uh, the dog can trail him. He's not like a man. And he can hunt that deer whether he's bleeding or not. And so yeah, the only way if that deer's a bleeding, the only way he can ever live is to get to where there's water. And if he can ever get where there's water, you drink that water, it'll stop the bleeding and, and he can get away. He's pretty smart. But now you can imagine seeing one of the little fellows wounded and bleeding and just how his little head up and all the sense that he has of uh, detecting where the water is with his nose, just he must find the water or perish. And now it's just life and death to him. He, just every, every, every bit of the scent that he has, he's trying, longing, he must find it. Now, that's the way we are to be thirsting for God. Amen. See, uh, as a heart thirsts for the water brook, my soul thirsts for thee, O God. God. Be hid away with Him somewhere. It's my heart's desire. And I, I trust that that is the desire of all that's in here tonight. And now, night after night, and I like to see this Faces, you see at one place, you see them at another. I, I like that. you showing your fellowship and expressing what we're here for. And oh, I'd sure love to see an old-fashioned revival in yes. Phoenix. Oh, my. That word Phoenix has thrilled me since the very first time I read it. Uh, uh, but Phoenix, Arizona. My little boy, I thought if I could ever get to that spot, if I could ever get there, to Phoenix. And now seeing it, and when we're here, we find it grossed in deepness of sin like all the rest of the places. Tourists falling in and drinking, crowding immorality, everything on hand. But yet, in the midst of all of that, you find some genuine jewels that God yeah, shook yeah, forth yeah, in this yeah. desert here yeah, that's yeah. shining in the crown of God's yeah. glorious yeah. people. And that's what I'm here for tonight, to put myself with you, brethren, and you, sisters, to try to shine the light of the Lord Jesus to others that they might uh, be uh, found also in this great uh, turmoil. And many of them are out there, yet I'm satisfied of that. There's still more to come in, and we must do everything we can to get them there and live a life that will reflect Christ. Now... Just before we read a little text of Scripture, I got in so late, I jotted down a few notes in about five minutes' time, and the federal income tax had just sent me some returns. I had to get in right away, and it's got to be postmarked, I think, maybe today yet. And so I got to get in the post office, and when I got in, Billy said, you better hurry. And so here, I just had a round and around and around with them fellows. My, oh, my. <laughs> They talk about justice on the courthouse doors. I wonder where it's at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never seen such. And they 
wanted me to pay income tax on every check that had been given me for the past 50 years to pay off the debts of the campaign with delinquency on it, see, $355,000. I said, just yeah, shoot me. <laughs> How would I ever do that? I said, I haven't got hardly over 55 cents. I said, how could I ever do that? And they've helped my nose to the wheel for five years. So I people putting in, like we're having a campaign and, and people, they just know my name's William Brand. They just make out a check for the expenses. The ministers take care of that. I never took offering in my life. And uh, so they do, I get a, a salary from a church, $100 a week. And this uh, offering, but everyone, you see that they put that in and next morning the the... the the one that was the head of the finance committee, he would come over and say, Brother Bram, you have to sign these checks. And Well, I'd just sign them and he'd put them in. And then they checked all that through and what one cent was ever spent for myself. But when I signed that check, they said it was mine. The people give it to me. Then I give it to the church. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I felt real bad at first. Then I come to find out that Every man in the Bible, I believe, that ever held a spiritual office for God was connected with the federal governments. Take it back and find it out. That's right. Moses, Daniel, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ died by the hand of the federal government under capital punishment. Peter, James, James, John, the Revelator, all, every, all... Suffered persecution. Why? It's the seat of Satan. Do you know that? You know, Satan tucked Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of a time. And he said, they're mine. I do with them whatever I want to. See? And I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me so you see who they belong to. We hate to think that about our own, but it is. So he said... Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. He knew he'd fall heir to him in the millennium. He knew they'd be his. When, when, if these countries were governed by God, the millennium would be on. But there will be a time. There are got UNs and leagues of nations and everything to try to bring peace. But as long as Satan's at the top of it in politics, what's going to happen? They'll fight just as sure as the world. But there will come a time when all arms will be stacked and the taps will sound and Amen. the morning breaks eternal bright and clear and our king shall take his throne oh there will be singing there will be shouting and there will be one flag one people one nation speaking one language heavenly Amen I long for that time and I'm pressing towards that mark Trusting to God someday when it's finished, I can say, I can hear him say to me, come up higher. I'm here in Phoenix tonight in the name of the Lord. I would, would not try to explain what's happened. You, many of you people that take the tapes, be sure to get that one. What time is it, sir? That's just before I left home. A vision sent me here. It's, I don't know what. I don't, I'm not a tape salesman and I don't uh, uh, stress those things. We get them and we got a tape business around the world, way into the jungles and everywhere. They have a little something they put in the ears they got and can tape it into the tape and stand there and translate that right into the language and it goes around the world. And, um, but the uh, one that I had that, uh, what time is it, sirs? Or is this the time, sirs? Some, uh, Saturday night, three weeks ago, at the church, after all my life of seeing visions, I never had anything like this before in my life. And I don't know what it is. I'm just here, but he sent me here. I don't know what it means. I'm just, I'm just here. And I must be honest and sincere. And that's the only way we'll ever get anywhere with God is be sincere. Because man will know, God knows in the beginning you're not, whether you are or not. And God, the man will know because as one time there was a man trying to prophesy and God told, or the real prophet told him, so let us remember there's been prophets before us. The prophet's only knowing when his prophecy comes to pass. So we better be sure that we know it. God said so before we say anything about it. Be honest and sincere. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer.
Now let's lay aside every care now for the next few minutes. I wonder in this lovely little group of people here tonight, I know that there are those jewels sitting here that Jesus shall come to get someday that will wake out of the dust. And there might be some here that not too sure whether they'd be there or not. You might have need of other things. If there is a need in your life tonight, let it be known to God as you just lift your hand and say, God, you know what I mean now. And bless me, I, I'm sick, I need healing, I'm, I'm wayward, I need to come back to a fellowship. I, I want to come back. I've, I've erred, I'm coming back. I want you to help me tonight to come back. God bless you. Heavenly Father, now as we are approaching thy throne by the way of the blood, for an Aaron went in before the, the mercy seat, he took first the blood in his hand and he went forward. And we by faith tonight receive the blood of the Lord Jesus and walk towards the throne of God boldly, knowing that we have a right to come, not in our own righteousness, but in his, the blood represents our cleansing. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will grant our petition. First, we would ask you to be merciful to us, pardoning us of all of our transgressions as we confess our wrongs and our uh, little errors and our secret sins and our unknown sins. And we confess also as ministers being priests the sins of the people. Together, Lord, we stand, we love the people. We feel like Moses when he threw himself in the breach to hold the people, the wrath of God. What a display that was of the righteousness of Christ when Christ threw himself in the breach to save the people. And Father, we as his servants with his spirit in us, ever Christian in your night, hold himself before the sinner. God be merciful to them. We cry for the sick and the needy, for those precious hands, some of them old and some young and some middle-aged, raising their hands. You know all about that, Lord. We pray that you'll answer according to your riches and glory. May there be many tonight, Lord, go away from here, that come in, that sick, may they go away well. Heal. Just something take place. They can't even explain it, but they know that they're well. May those who are wayward go away justified, Lord, knowing that they've come back and picked up Christ where they left Him at. May they go make restitutions. Grant, Lord, that those who have never come will find that precious freedom of being free, turned out of the cage, no more bound by the things of the world and the cares of this life, but has been made free in Christ. Grant it, Father. Bless all we have need of now, and bless thy word and thy servant, and we'll give thee praise. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, if we should read a text of the Scripture, or a Scripture for a text, rather, 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, the 8th verse, reads like this. And 1 Corinthians 14, 8. For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? This would be enough text that we could be preaching two weeks from now on. And yet, never touch the edges of it. There's something about the Word that's inspired. Yes. You're constantly on that one text. You can tie the entire Bible with it. It's correct. One day a fellow asked me, he said, How can you take the same text? I said, Oh my. You take a context of anything from it. I picked up a little three-leaf clover laying on the ground and held it up. The man sitting here tonight from Tucson. And we was over in Pasadena, California. And I said, I can take this three-leaf clover and preach 25 years on it. 
how it is, the life that's in it, how the three blades being the Trinity in one, and oh, oh, there's just so many things that we could say about it. And how about a scripture? It's God's word. It's eternal. It, it had, it has no end. It just keeps going on, on, on. It's a refuge to us. And now tonight, I want to speak on this. A trumpet gives an uncertain sound. And thinking of it just a few moments ago when I was thinking on the, that income tax affair, I thought, there's hardly anything today that's certain. Everything's got such an uncertainty to it. And anything that's uncertain cannot be trusted. Anything that's uncertain cannot be trusted. Stay away from it if it's not certain. If you've got a business in which we got businessmen present, maybe many of them, if you are running a business that's not certain, you're not going to put very much in it. Because the, the dividend is uncertain and you wouldn't make very much investment in it. Or if you're a good, shrewd businessman, you'll wait and search out if you've got some money to invest until you find something that's certain, something that's reliable, something that you can depend on because you don't want to lose that little money that you saved up uh, because with that, you have to make your living out of the remuneration from, from the dividends that's brought on this investment. Why, you have to, uh, to get something to live by. And this little money that you've got saved up, don't put it in your pocket and leave it there because thieves will steal it. <laughs> See, don't, don't do that. If you've got it invested in something, and then you want to be sure of the certainty of your investment. If you don't, why, uh, don't invest it at all. So business is certainly on a shaking stand tonight. Any business, practically in the world, is in a shaking condition because the world's in a shaking condition. You just can't uh, allow yourself. Now, I'm going to save so much money to build me a nice little home somewhere. That... That's pretty shaky, I'll tell you it is, because the government could take it all over, overnight. Oh, the things that's got our democracy so corrupted until it's real shaking. We used to could put a lot of confidence in our democracy, in which I do think it's the best form of government. But still, our democracy is shaking. Because uh, we are, this nation, our people, we have a constitution. And this constitution is, is our ultimate. But yet in that, our constitution is shaking. Because it's already been broken many times. The late Mr. Roosevelt made havoc out of it. So, see, you see, it can be broken. It's not much confidence you can put into it. Politics, oh my, how shaky. People are just arguing, arguing, arguing about politics and neighbors will fall out about it. And uh, people that were once good friends, some president will raise up or somebody to run for the sheriff or something. And the other fellow on the other side of the political fence and they'll fuss with one another until they fall out about it. Politics. And if, I don't hope I don't hurt anybody's feelings, but I think the whole thing's rotten. <laughs> yes, sir. So why would you fuss and fall out about something that ain't no good anyhow? <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's just awful bad. Someone said to me the other day, he said, are, are you going to vote uh, uh, this election? I said, I done voted. <laughs> said, oh... In this election, I said, eh, I, I voted for Jesus. I said, I'll tell you, 
there was two people voting for me. I said, God voted for me and the devil voted against me. And I voted for God, so I get my vote right. <laughs> Depends on where you cast your vote, how you're going to come out. <laughs> so, notice, just recently to show you just a little spot and then we'll leave it. In this last presidential election, when it was absolutely proven in Chicago and different places that the machines that they got the vote by, that they were set up by the Democratic Party that every time you voted for Mr. Nixon, you had to vote for Mr. Kennedy at the same time. So you don't have a chance. <laughs> and proved it. And you heard Monitor the other night when they put a, a survey across the country from the Mississippi East. Mr. Nixon had taken the, this calling in vote four to one. How can a man win? If it had been Mr. Kennedy, it had been the same way. I don't have either party. My party is in heaven, and I'm right with them here tonight. We're sitting in heavenly places talking of our king. But you see, I'm trying to tell you if these things of the earth is shaking. There's no, can't put no confidence in them. They're uncertain. And anything that's uncertain, I'd just rather leave away from it. I don't like that negative thing. I don't like it mixed up in the negative side. I like it positive. I'll be on the positive side. Now, home life has become uncertain. You know, I seen a piece the other day in one of the journals somewhere that the American uh, divorce rate is higher than any other nation in the world. And we are supposed to be a religious nation. Yes, it could be that. Religion, all right. But uh, it's not the right kind. Religion is just a covering. It's hard to tell what we make our covering out of. Adam tried to make some out of fig leaves and it didn't work. He got awful shaky when he had to come out to meet God. So religion doesn't mean it all. But could you think that our divorce rate higher than, than uh, all the rest of the countries are divorce rate. We find immorality on the move in our homes. It was astounding to find out that a great percent on a survey of the nations, and in the, I believe it was in Ohio, that a survey was taken of Christianity. And it was alarming what a percent that did not even go to church. And then about 80% of those that went to church didn't know why they went. Hmm. They don't know why they go. They just go to church. Why do you go? Well, mother took us when we was a kid and we just keep on going. And, and uh, then out another percent of that said that they went this far oh, to meet their neighbors and talk a while. See? Why, it's alarming. No wonder the home life is gone. See, uh, any home life, it's not stable. Any woman that's going to marry a man and she's not certain of that man, she better leave him alone. And any man that's going to marry a woman and not certain, you better leave her alone. You better pray through on it. Until God gives you the answer. And then what? God joins together. Let no man put asunder. But we, uh, we first we must pray through on that. Yes. Now, we find out that we have tried to convert the world by an educational program. And we've really made a mess out of it, sure enough. You cannot... Convert the world to Christ through education. Amen. Education draws him away from God more than it draws him to God. Because he tries to think he's smarter than knows more than somebody else. As good as education is, Christ never did commission his church to educate the world. He never did educate them to make seminaries. He never did edu Oh, they're good. He never did tell them to go on and uh, build hospitals. That's all right. But the church's business is to preach the gospel. 
Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. See? But uh, anything different from that gets shaky because it's out of the program of God. The na national life is uncertain. Where the world is uncertain. We're just living in a place where the whole world's having a nervous prostration, look like. Shaking all, every nation, everybody, one's afraid of the other one. They talk peace. They had one time, they said, oh, when we fight the first war of war out, that all of our boys must go over there and that'll settle wars. Why, they didn't even get the artillery smoke fanned out of the air until there's on another one. Then they had the League of Nations and that was going to police the world. And it fell through. Now they got the UN and it's just the same thing. It's done fell through. There's nothing to it. Amen. Everything's shaking. National life, political life, voting machines. Oh my. They're just, the whole thing shook up. Everything. Now, I want to bring it down a little closer to home. See? Church life is shook up and uncertain. Now that's what Paul was speaking of. See? That's where he meant if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound. Church life is shook up. The people don't know hardly what to do. They go wandering from church to church trying to find out which has the right thing. From pillar to post trying to find what is right. Where is the right doctrine? And one will come around and they can explain it just almost to the very point of their creed is right. And then the first thing you know, they find so much corruption in that until they try another church to see what their creed is. Doctrine. Oh, all this we find out that we have broken ourselves up then by these things. The hundreds of different orders of church. Now, there's nothing against that. That's just that they can uh, do the other things and that they do do. And they bound to be some good come out of it somewhere. But you see, you can't put your confidence in saying, I belong to the Methodist Association of Churches and I I'm all right because I belong to it. I, I, I belong to the Baptist Association and uh, I'm all right. You can't do that. You can't even do it when you say you belong to the Pentecostal Association of Churches. You can't do that. You mustn't do that. Because it's not. We find out that when our first Pentecostal Association, the uh, General Council, was um, set in order, it wasn't very long till they began to break from there and break from here and issues and doctrines. and Now just look at it everywhere. See? It goes to show that it's uncertain. Those who trust in just organization alone, uh, it's, it's uncertain. Now you would say, Brother Branham, you're taking us out on a big limb out here. You're painting an awful dark picture. And I intended to do that. I, I wanted to do it. I did it for a purpose. That I might say this, is there anything certain? Yes. There's one thing that's certain. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, I'm so glad of that. That there's one thing that you can put your confidence in and be sure that it's right. Oh, when everything else is gone, this will be standing. If you read St. Matthew 24, 35, he said, Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not fail. God has a certain foundation. An old fellow said one time, an old darky down south, he packed the Bible. And he couldn't read. And they said, why are you packing it for, Sam? He said, it's, uh, it's the Holy Bible. He said, it's written on it. He said, I believe it from kiver to kiver and believe the kiver also. He said, because it's got Holy Bible wrote on it. And the uh, fellow was talking to him, said, you don't believe all this. And I said, yes, I sure do. He said, now, well, you mean you do anything that Bible said do? He said, yes, sir. He said, what if that Bible said for Sam to jump through that stone wall there? What would you do? He said, I'd jump. 
He said, but how are you going to get through the stone wall without a hole being there? He said, if the Bible said for Sam to jump, there'd be a hole there when Sam got there. So that, that's just about right. There'd be a hole there. Only thing you have to do is take your stand up on God's Word. And God will make the way for the rest of it. Oh, that great foundation. I believe he said over in Luke, I believe it was, were coming down off the mountain. He said to the disciples, Who does man say, I the Son of Man am? And one said, Jeremiah and the prophets and so forth. He said, But who do you say that I am? That's when Peter made the notable statement, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonas, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father which is in heaven revealed this to you. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is it then? Upon the revealed truth of God's Word. For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among, and it was revealed to Peter that that was God's vindicated Word. Amen. Amen. That's the reason you can say, who can condemn me of sin? Who can accuse me? Everything the Word's written of me, I've performed it. God has vindicated it. That He was the Word. Oh, that's it. God's manifested. The Word says so, and then God makes it real, brings it to pass, shows it. Years ago when they said to the church, there's no such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's just an emotion that people got themselves worked up. But those who received it know that was the truth. They know God was real. And it's been proven until today the Pentecostal move of God across the nations has brought more into Christ than all the rest of them has. Our Sunday visitor not long ago, the Catholic paper said, I believe the year before last or last year one, that the Catholic Church only registered a half a million converts where the Pentecostals registered 1,500,000. Amen. What is it? It's a growing thing. God's Word spreading abroad. How thankful we should be. It's so much to even now. The Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and all are coming to get some of it. You notice in the businessman's needing. You hear them speaking of different ones, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Presbyterian. Why, you very seldom ever hear of a Pentecostal doing anything anymore. (laughs) That's right. It's all the others because why? They have seen the weakness of their creeds and they return back to the Word. Oh, you find a foundation, something that cannot be moved. Finding there the Holy Spirit living His life in human beings, manifesting Himself to the world. And it makes man thirst for Him. Unshakable, undisputable, the Word of God manifested and showing Himself. The Word itself being lived out through human life. What a wonderful thing. There's nothing uncertain about that. You can see where God made a promise and here it is being made manifest. Hundreds of years ago, the prophet spoke of it and here we see it coming to pass. All through the criticism, all through the differences, all through the creeds, how they've tried to stomp out that Word of God. How they tried to substitute education. They tried to substitute and make denomination. They have confuse themselves and out of all of it the word of God still stands just as bright and shiny as she ever did. What is it? It's that thing that is certain. God said both heavens and earth will pass away but my word shall not fail. 
then that's something that's certain. If you want to anchor yourself, anchor that word in your heart. David said he hid it in his heart that he would sin not. He wrote his laws upon the bedpost and uh, tied them to his hands and everywhere. Put his word always before him. That's the way. Keep your mind constantly. God told Joshua, don't turn to the right or to the left from it. Then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous. Then you shall have good success. And when the church all unites itself together away from its creeds and upon the Word of God, then the church will have good success. Amen. That'll be the thing that'll stop out communism. Amen. What made communism? The very thing you think communism, when it's spreading their propaganda and growing by the leaps, by the millions, and people scared about it, that communism will fade and die. It's got to. Communism, they may do this, they might do that. I believe God's going to use it. <laughs> but that's right. It's like he did Nebuchadnezzar. He'll storm out the, 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 all the terriers out with communism. But that, no so much for that. But look, but the thing, communism will have an end. Communism will come to its end. But the Word of God has no end. Because it had no beginning. And it's eternal with God. And if you're anchored in the Word, is anchored in you, you're eternal with the Word. Amen. It's got to come to its end. All those things are shaking. No matter how big they're building a pillar, it's got to fall down. All things that's not of against that Word or contrary to it will have to move. It'll have to give place. Because the Word's coming triumphantly. There's nothing can stop it. God's done said so. When He speaks it, heavens and earth will pass away, but it'll never fail. Hide that Word in your heart. How to take that Word and let it grow. Keep it in your mind always because it will never fail. God's Word will never fail because He said it wouldn't. So we want to keep it on that. Now... Paul said in the Scriptures, it, uh, like training a soldier, a, a, a soldier to a sound. Now, a soldier's got to learn the sounds of, his, uh, of the bugle or the trumpet. He doesn't know if the trumpet go, tr blows, whether to, to charge or whether to retreat. If he doesn't know the difference, what kind of a mixed-up army would you have? The enemy would certainly triumph over a bunch of soldiers that were no better trained than that. Amen. That's what's the matter with our churches today. We're trained them on creeds, differing one to the other. We've got to be united. We've got to know a trumpet. Then which is the trumpet, they say? The gospel trumpet. That's it. The word of the living God is a trumpet. Don't mix nothing with it. Don't. Try somebody play a French harp and another blow a bugle. <laughs> Nobody knows what to do. It brings a confusion. And Paul was talking about training a man to a sound. And just as that sound is, he knows exactly what to do. Because the bugler has got uh, orders and from the chief captain. And when he sounds this trumpet, the army knows just exactly the place to to advance and where to withdraw and whether to turn right or left or what to do by the sounding of the trumpet. Amen. Now, army, war, it's always been war. We never joined the church or come into the church uh, to come to a picnic. Amen. We must realize we are coming to a battleground. Oh, I never come for people to pat me on the back and say, Brother Branham, you're a wonderful person. No, sir, I come there with a shield on. I don't need a shield for that. I come with a helm and the armor. I come to fight. Fight every inch of the ground. God told Joshua, every place a soldier your foot treads upon, that I give you. So footsteps meant possession. And when the church gets to a place that compromises with creeds and compromises with the Word, and compromises with the world, I mean, then it's losing ground. It's taken back. 
What we need tonight is soldiers to possess every divine promise in this Bible that God promised to the church. Oh, armor of God and to stand. It's what we need. Soldiers. Not get a uniform for a dress parade. It's always different. When a man, any nation, we got spies through every nation. We got German spies here. We got English spies here. We got, we got spies over in England. What are they trying to do? They're trying to find out what kind of a material, what kind of a bomb the other one's got. FBI's for near every nation. They're watching to see that's how they survive. They watch and see what kind of a bomb the other one gets. Then they come by and make it a little better or make something to counteract it. We don't trust one another in the nations because that shows that nations are shaking. Why England would blow us up in an hour if we cross their path or we'd blow them up. Just take somebody up at the head of the thing there to get a little drink or two too many or fall out with something and then the way it goes. Here not long ago they'd say a little piece of goods made in Japan during the war. They'd slam it on the floor and walk around patriotic. And now you pay a bigger price for it than anything you buy in the nation. What happened? Does that pay back the lives of those boys that died over there? Certainly not. What is it? I don't care how much you fight in the material things. You're going, it won't mean one thing. It'll shake. But there's one fight that you can get into and gain grounds that can never be taken away from you. That's the gospel sound of the trumpet of God's word and his possessive gifts and promises that he gives to the church. Amen. Certainly is. Now we find. We find giving this trumpet sound. Now, every nation tries to arm their boys with the very best of defense that they can have. Now, I know sometimes these armors are not easy to pack. I had a brother, a rookie they called it, goes out here and the army gives him a 90-pound pack on his back, and that's pretty as much as he weighed. They give him a shovel to dig a hole with, a rifle, and a whole bunch of hand grenades. And uh, a whole, i never seen such a pack. The poor little fellow couldn't hardly move. And they took him down the road for a five-mile hike. <laughs> he liked to kill him. He said, what's this nonsense for? What do I need with this great big old helmet? Now, look, the army knows he's going to need that sometime. What I want with a shovel out here on the highway walking? Better get used to using it. <laughs> you might need it. The government isn't going to issue the little thing unless you know uh, they know you're going to have to use it. You must train for that. They find the best things that they can find to protect you with because they're interested in the nation. They're interested in you being fortified. The best that you can away from the bullets. That's always been that. It started in the Garden of Eden. And God trains His church. And, uh, you know, we always have to improve. Now, the old airplanes we used to use back in the First World War, the Second World War, all oh, them little knockers in the air was all together out when they put up these nice big uh, uh, super planes they had. Well, they were nothing. And now the ones that they just used in this last war, now they're obsolete. They don't need them anymore. they got jets. And see, you're always trying to improve, to improve on the, uh, the thing for defense. But you know what? God don't have to improve. Praise God. God gave His children, His soldiers, the very best thing that could be given them. When He gave them, what did He give them? He gave them His Word. At the Garden of Eden, and man must have fortified himself behind the Word of God, and no devil can get him. Stay in the Word. Now, the enemy spy, Satan, tried to find out what could he do to break into that. So he, he knew he just couldn't come out and bluff her. So the only thing that he could do was to get her own reasoning. And that's what God uses today to fortify his church is his word. And Satan comes around with reasoning power. Amen. Satan knew that was a loophole. That was a place that people would break the easiest was at reasoning. You say, now, let me just reason with you. Now, is it necessary? If God said it was necessary, it's necessary. 
Well, do we have to cry and boo-hoo and do all this? If God said that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is necessary, I don't care how heavy it is and how much of the world you have to give up, you're going to have to use it one of these days to stay alive. The only way of survival. Now, should we practice divine healing when we got the best doctors in the world? God gave you divine healing because He knows you have to use it. He gave you the gifts of the Spirit. And as soon as Satan got around Eve, he began to reason with her. Now, surely, surely God wouldn't do that. The people say today, there's no such a thing as hell. Let him tell you that. See, oh, surely God wouldn't burn his children. Certainly he doesn't burn his children, but the devil will his. Whose child are you? That's the next thing. Hell was created for the devil and his children, not God's children. Not one of them's going there. That's right. It depends on whose child you are. Now, God gave Eve and Adam his word, and he's never changed it. He's always had the Christian or the believer, his defense is the word. Heavens and earth will pass away. Every creed will pass away. Every denomination will fail. Every nation will sink. God's word will stand eternally. There will be a time when the morning star won't shine any longer. There will be a time that the sun won't shine and the moon won't shine and the world won't spin in its orbit. But God's word forever will remain the same. That's something that cannot be moved. Something that you can depend on. It's certain. God says anything, it's certain to happen. If he said in the Garden of Eden to our Redeemer, he would send the Messiah, it was certain to come. Though 4,000 years they waited, but he got there. He had to come. Because it was a promised word of God. God promised to send him back again. He'll be here. I don't care how many infidels and skeptics rise. Whatever they do, how much communism spreads, Jesus Christ will come and will get a church that's blood washed and will take it on a sky right into heaven. Ah, it's certain to be God's word said so. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. That's certain. God said so. And it can't move can't be shuck away god said so if you just stay with it now and have faith in it believe it it's not an uncertain sound god cannot give an uncertain sound creeds can give an uncertain sound denominations can preach an uncertain sound but god cannot utter an uncertain sound and this word is god and it's not an uncertainty about it it's every bit certain. Now, the great church is armored by the Word. Now, when Jesus come, did He use that same armor? He certainly did. When Satan come to Him in all of His strength, and He said, If thou be the Son of God, do certain, certain things. He said, It is written. Right back to the Word. Satan tried Him a little higher. But Jesus, right back with the Word. It is written. There He remained upon that Word. Showing to us as an example. As He said in 1 Corinthians, I've uh, uh, first, uh, St. John 14, 13. I have given you an example. And that is an example. That we should emphatically, we should perfectly put our trust in the Word of God. And let everything else be a lie. That's one thing that's certain. God made the promise. God's going to keep the promise. They say, how can this thing happen? How can He get a bunch of people together with rapture and grace to go up? I don't know how you do it. It's not my business to ask how you do it. It's my business just to be ready for it. <laughs> he promised it. It's going to happen. Fortified His church by the Word. And the first thing was reason. Now they say, isn't it just reasonable now? If I belong to this church, isn't that just as good as that church? There's only one church you can belong to. You'll never join it. You might join the lodge. 
Methodist Lodge and a Presbyterian Lodge and the Baptist Lodge and a Pentecostal Lodge. But you're born into the church of Jesus Christ. So there's the church. Those are lodges where people come together like crows set on this limb and doves on this limb and, and so forth. That's your fellowship you have together when you're sharing on the same diet. But when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, there's only one avenue. That's birth. Birth. It's just like a person, like I've said many times, like a, a blackbird sitting on the limb trying to put peacock feathers in his wings and say, you see, I'm a strutting peacock. <laughs> see? He stuck them feathers in himself. If he was genuine peacock, his nature would put forth that kind of a feather. <laughs> If the church of the living God is the church of the living God, it'll put forth the word of the living God. You don't have to add peacock feathers nowhere. And every feather in there will be a join to a peacock. You can just believe that. And every feather that's joined into the church of God will be the word of God. He'll never inject anything else but the word. Amen. Because the nature of the spirit puts out only the word. Amen. I can feel religious. Right. Not nothing you try to do, nothing you manufacture. You can't manufacture, you can't manufacture salvation. You can't manufacture the gifts. You've got to bear the gifts. Certainly. See, the, the sheep doesn't, uh, he doesn't manufacture wool. He has wool because he's a sheep. He just bears wool. The, the, the cherry tree doesn't manufacture cherries. It just bears cherries because the life of it's that way. And the church of the living God doesn't inject this to try to make themselves look like something. They're already what they are by the grace of God. And the word of God is joined with them and they're joined with the word. And the works that was brought forth in that perfect one, Jesus Christ, God manifested in flesh will produce itself to every born again believer. He said so. Amen. Nothing else. Now that's something certain. Now it would be a bit confusing to a man if he never knew the real sound of the trumpet. Now, the man that's never been trained to the trumpet and never heard it, well, he might be a bit confused when he hears something sound different from what he's heard. He's always been heard, join the church. Take your letter over here and over here. That might be all right. That's all he knows. But then when you go coming back about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking about the power of God and the things that he does and how... Uh, it makes the women and men both clean themselves up from a life of sin. How it makes them walk godly, honestly. And the things that it does, it brings forth the baptism, speaking in tongues, healing the sick, casting out devils, prophesying gifts, woe, visions, everything in the church. Hallelujah. That's right. When it goes down, it's a bit confusing to them. It never heard that kind of a trumpet. Well, you say, my church doesn't teach that. Then it isn't blowing the gospel trumpet. Glory. Right. But to them trained soldiers, hallelujah, when they hear that trumpet sound, they know how to stand in order. Onward, Christian soldier. Glory. Uh, that's certain. How do you know it's certain? It's on the Word. Well, they say our church doesn't teach that, but the trumpet sounds it. I don't want to be trained to a church creed because it'll shake and fall. But if you're trained to the Word, heavens and earth will pass away and this Word will never pass away. Amen. Ever create everything else will fall, but this Word will never fail. Amen. Amen. That's the sound. That's the sound I want to hear. Yes, sir. Oh, you say, how do I know? Jesus said, my sheep hear my sound. <laughs> they know my trumpet. He said in St. John 14, chapter and 12, verse he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he'll do also. Amen. Now, he said that. Amen. The man said, well, Hebrews 13, 8 said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever. Oh, they say, in a certain way. Now, real sheep say, oh, oh. Now, something squeaked in that. <laughs> that didn't sound right. <laughs> oh, that must have been a French harp. That wasn't a trumpet. Because <laughs> the Bible gives no uncertain sound. It says you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Not you might, you will. Amen. Everyone. Amen. How long? To your children and your children's children. And them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
He'll sound the trumpet in every race and every generation, and they'll hear his voice. They'll believe it, those that's ordained alive. Amen. They'll believe it because they know it's a gospel trumpet sounding. It's not uncertain. Every soldier knows how to stand. Now, you've seen Peter and John, James, and the early church marching forward this way because the trumpet Jesus said, Go ye in all the world, preach the gospel. Mark 16. See? These signs shall follow them that believe. We see Peter, James, John, the rest of them lining up, marching that, and we turning some other way away from it. One going forward, another going backward. One saying, well, that was for that, that, that sound was for another. Oh, no. It can't be that. The whole Christian army hears the trumpet. God said that was a trumpet. He can't change it. That's the sound that he said would sound by. This will all men know. And the uh, way that goes to church. Some of them don't believe in his literal coming. The Bible said he will come. So we are looking for his coming. If he isn't here tonight, we'll be looking in the morning. If he isn't here in the morning, we'll be looking tomorrow night for him. And we'll keep on looking. If we fall asleep, our, our, we haven't fainted in vain. For the trumpet of God shall sound that final trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and forever be there. That's the sound of the trumpet. Whether I live or whether I'm gone, don't make any difference. I'll hear the sound. Now rise. Glory to God. Rise. Oh, yes. Yes, Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. He was the Word made manifest. When the... That's how his sheep knowed him. Now look at the Pharisees and them in that day. Oh, they said, this man's Beelzebub. When he told the woman at the well where about her sins, her husband she had. When he told Nathaniel where he was under the tree where Philip called him, out under the fig tree praying. Well, those teachers of that day said, this man's Beelzebub. He's a devil. He's a fortune teller. But that wasn't so with Peter, James, and John. <laughs> the rest of them, they knowed it. Why? They know that God said that when the Messiah would come under the inspired voice of Moses, he will be a prophet. And when they seen those things that he said being manifested and made perfect, they know that was sheep food. <laughs> they know that was the trumpet. And they started following it. My sheep know it. Because they seen the word of God being manifested. Now the people today that don't believe there is such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Drop in here somewhere where you have the Holy Ghost and they see the promise of God being fulfilled just exactly while my sheep hear my voice. They know the sound of that trumpet because it's a Bible. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever. He's still Hebrews 13, 8. <laughs> exactly. I don't care. Not, don't make a bit of difference how many uh, church horns is blowing. <laughs> we got a lot of church tutor horns, you know tooting around and everything saying all oh, days of miracles just passed there's no such a thing as divine healing all oh, the real sheep don't listen for that but they listen for that trumpet Amen. that positive Amen. that church horn might sound anything you might have look what it's got today the church horns one's running this way and one's running that way and the devil's sitting back and say boy they just fighting one another Amen. that's all I don't even have to move my hand but brother let them all come to arms one time Amen. come back to general orders Oh, my. Then you're going to see an onward Christian soldier's right. Yeah. Not listening to horns, but listening to the trumpet. <laughs> Let's just stop this for a minute and go back and look at a few. Now, we're fixing to close because I don't want to keep you here so long. But let's go back and look at some that heard this sound. Let's take, and they were certain. Now, I've showed you everything else is uncertain. Let's just take one old character for a moment. Let's take the prophet Job. Now, that man went through a test, but he knew that God required a burnt offering. That's what God required, and that's all he required. And no matter how much disaster happened to his home, God don't always, when you see something going wrong for a fellow, that don't mean that he's being whipped by God. It might not be that he's out of the will of God. He knows in his heart whether he's listening to the trumpet or not. God required this burnt offering, and Job stood right on it. That's all. They said, Job, you're a secret sinner. You're doing something that's wrong. But he knew there. He stayed right there because he had heard the sound of the trumpet, and he stayed right there with it. Yeah. And finally, right down at the last end, when he was, 
the devil had been turned loose on him and took his family and took his children, took his camels and took all of his wealth and broke his own health down. He sat on an ash heap. Looked like everything was gone, but he still said, I know my Redeemer liveth. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At the last days he'll stand on the earth Though the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God. <laughs> Nothing uncertain about that, was there? Not, I, I, I kind of think he, he lives. He said, I know he lives. And he shall stand at the last days upon the earth. Though the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'll see God. Oh, my. It happened. He was very certain. Abraham. Out walking in the field one day, heard God say, Abraham, I'm going, he met Abraham before the written word, and he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son by your wife, Sarah. And she was 65 years old at that time, and Abraham was 75. And they made ready for it. And he wasn't ashamed to testify. He knew he was going to have the son. And the Bible said he staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was fully persuaded. Amen. Fully persuaded. That means that he's met the ultimate. Amen. That's it. The ultimate's the end of the road. It's the last thing. It's, it's all of it. He said, I'm fully persuaded that what God promised, God is able to perform. Are you tonight? Are you fully persuaded that this is the Holy Ghost? Are you fully persuaded this is the way? Are you fully persuaded He's a healer? Are you fully persuaded that He's coming again? Are you fully persuaded He's the same yesterday and forever? Amen. Fully persuaded. Yes. Let's carry another one. Elijah. Standing up on the mountain. He had fussed with Jezebel and her painted face and he's kind of getting tired of it. About all the women patterned at the first lady. <laughs> Maybe waterhead haircuts and whatever they had in that day. He had fussed at it so much till he about to get him down. Directly God said to him, get down there. You know, it rains about every two or three days in a week around here. But you stand they have. And you tell him, thus saith the Lord, the dew won't fall from heaven till I call for it. Oh, my. He didn't say, now, Ahab, perhaps, maybe, it might work out this way. Oh, no. no, no. He was fully persuaded. Nothing uncertain. The dew will not fall. The rains will not come until I call for it. Amen. Glory. Oh, why? He heard the trumpet. It was certain. He knowed his God. He knowed something. Would, when God spoke that word, all heavens and earth would pass away until it, it happened. It would have to happen. He was surely persuaded. Now, he said, Elijah, I want you to get up there in the driest place in the country and come up on the mountain where there won't no springs, but I have one up there for you. He was fully persuaded. <laughs> he climbed up on the mountain, sat down by the brook Cedrath, and now what am I going to do up here? I've already commanded the ravens to feed you. Now how's them ravens? Now well, wait a minute, Lord. No, no. <laughs> the trumpet sounded. That's enough. How's it going to happen? I don't know. I don't care. See, it isn't for me to worry about that. That's God's business. He said he commanded the ravens. Well, Lord, would you please break it down to me and tell me just where them, what school those ravens went to to learn to speak Hebrew? <laughs> Uh, 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 what kind of a... Do they cook on gas stoves or do they have a wood fire? Uh, how do they do it? And where will we... Uh, what kind of an animal will they kill? They're just a small bird. How do they go to kill a beef for me to bring me a beef sandwich? See? <laughs> See? That wasn't question. God, the, the trumpet of God, His voice sounded forth and said, I have! Amen. Now, Elijah, I might do it. I have done it. Amen. I will do it. I've already done it. Hey, man, that's our God tonight. God, He will do it. He's already done it. Amen. Yeah, that's good. He's already done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Not he will, he might. Probably he will, he's already done it. Yeah. I've commanded the ravens. 
He commanded His Spirit to all men. <laughs> he commanded His blessings. He ascended on high, give gifts to man. Somebody's going to get it. Somebody will turn it away. It's not my business how it comes. It's just so it gets there. God said it would be so, and it's so. Yeah. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. How's it going to come? I don't know. The, the promise isn't to your children, to them it's far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, you couldn't explain that away. Amen. The trumpet's done sounded, and I believe it. I obeyed it and got it. Amen. Now try to argue me out of it once. Amen. Well, I'm not perfect, no. Like that night, the old colored sister, she said, uh, Elder, can I give a testimony? Yes, ma'am. She says, uh, I want to say this one thing. She said, I, I, I hate what I want to be. And she said, I hate what I, I ought to be. But there's one thing I know, I hate what I used to be. So that, that's the way we feel about it now. <laughs> I'm not what I used to be because I'm saved tonight by the grace of God and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost upon the commission. It was poured out there on the day of Pentecost, the promise given, and I believed it. Nothing uncertain. I heard the sound. I obeyed it, and I'm certain that's what it is. Certainly. I know it is. Sir, Simeon, an old sage, about 80 years old, Hundreds of years since even a prophet being on earth, but walking around with a great reputation. The Holy Ghost spoke to him one day, said, Simeon, you know, you're not going to die <laughs> until you see the Lord's salvation. <laughs> Glory! Perhaps the high priest rubbing his beard a few times and said, Simeon, uh, you, you should comb your beard on the other side. He said, that don't make a bit of difference. <laughs> How do you know you're right? The Holy Ghost told me so. I'll not die. Why, Simeon, why, uh, why, you're ready to die right now? I don't care what you say. But uh, God told me that I would not see death until I've seen his salvation. Amen. Nothing uncertain. I won't die. Hallelujah. I can't Lord. see death till I see him. How you going to do it, Simeon? Uh, that's not my business. Where's yet, Simeon? I don't know. How you know you're going to see him? God said so. That's it. It's the word. I'm not going to see death until I see him. Oh, my. Oh, poor old fellow. Of course, he's off at his head, you know, so just let him alone. But he saw him anyhow. Yes, sir. God makes a way for them people who will take his word. Jesus, when he was here on earth, and he was standing there at the grave of Lazarus. Uh, before that, when he was in the discourse with the, uh, with the people of talking about how he yet being now 50 years old and said that he's seen Abraham. You notice how positive it was? He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> I am. Not I was, or I will be, but I am. I'm positive. Then he said, the grave of Lazarus. Before he went down there, he said, told Martha. He said, I am the resurrection of the life. Not I ought to be or I will be, but I am. Amen. Amen. My brother, if you'd have been here, would not have died. But even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. He said, Thy brother shall rise again. Oh, he'll rise in the last days at the general resurrection. He was a good boy. I don't believe he'll rise. But Jesus straightened him a little self up and said, But I am the resurrection and life. Not I will be, I ought to be, or so forth. I am. There's nothing, there, there's nothing wavering, shaking about that. Nothing uncertain. It was positive. I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Not, not they might not. They perhaps won't. They won't. Amen. Nothing, nothing uncertain about it. They won't die. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. And shall not even come to the judgment, but it's already passed from death into life. They should not come to the judgment. They won't come to the judgment. Amen. Amen. He took my judgment. I got no business there. <laughs> Amen. There you are. Passed from death unto life. Oh, now she said she believed it. Now Jesus never said, well, you know, believe that you believe that. And you know what? I am the word. And... Uh, 
And I, I, you know that I am he that was to come. You've confessed that. And you believe it. I'll tell you what we might do. Let's go get the elders together and go down and see if we can do anything about it. No, no. He said, I'll not go down and see if I can raise him up. I'll go wake him. Amen. Amen. No, I'll, I'll try. I will. <laughs> Nothing uncertain. That was no uncertain sound when he said, I will. I will. And the same one said, I will made you a promise. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, hey, Amen. I will go and wake him. Again, he said, destroy this temple. And I'll see what I can do about it. <laughs> you destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Amen. Nothing uncertain. Now, I'll try. You all might stand around and see if I can do it or not. <laughs> no. I will raise it up. Amen. Nothing uncertain. I will raise it up. Hallelujah. You, de you destroy it, I'll raise it up. Oh, my, why? He know that he was that person in the Scripture that David spoke of. Amen. I will not leave his soul in hell, neither will I suffer my Holy One to see corruption. And he knew he was included in that scriptural promise. So therefore, he was positive. Now, can't we be that positive? We take him example for other things. As long as God's Word said it, can't we be as positive about the Word as he was about it? I am the resurrection and life. I will raise it up again. Amen. Why, he knew the Word spoke of it. And he was sure to come forth. If I'm that person over there in John 5, 24, he that yearth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and I will raise him up again at the last days. He'll not come into judgment, pass from death unto life. That's, that's us. Amen. Now, what are we scared about? What's the matter? What difference does it make what brand you're wearing? You call yourself uh, this, that, or the other. We're children of God by the grace of God. We've been filled with the Holy Ghost by the grace of God. What difference does it make about whether this one's that or that? If he's a Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, if he's filled with the Holy Ghost, he's got resurrecting life. Amen. 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 Yes. Now, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus told them in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise. Not I might do it. I'll see what I can do about it. I will send the promise of my Father upon you, but go up there to the city of Jerusalem and wait until you're endued with power. Now, what if it waited long, say, oh, six days? They said, what are we waiting on? I believe you are to accept it by faith. Don't you think so? <laughs> what if James said on the, on the ninth day, said, Simon, come here a minute. You know, the other day I had kind of peculiar feeling. See? And you know what I believe? I, I, I believe he just don't want us to wait around. Yeah, I believe we've, we've already got it. Don't you think so? Let's go on with our work. Let's continue on with our ministry. Oh, it'll never happen. Why? They know that the prophet said. Listen. The prophet said, precept must be upon precept. Line must be upon line upon line. Here a little and there a little and hold fast to that what's good. For with stammer lips and with other tongues will I speak to this people. And this is the rest of the Sabbath. They know something had to take place when it come. Yeah. I'll pour out my spirit in the last days, Joel 2.28. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy upon my hands, maids and maids, servant. I'll pour out of my spirit in that day. I'll show signs in the heaven above and, and in the earth below and fire and smoke and vapor. They know that there had to be some experience accompany that coming of the Holy Ghost. They wasn't taking an uncertain sound. But when they felt that something move and seen the Bible evidence moving with it, <laughs> there wasn't uncertain. Right out into the streets they went. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh my! They were certain it was the Holy Ghost. You know how certain it was? To Peter, that little uneducated fellow jumped up on a stump or a box or somewhere. Said, "You man of Judea, <laughs> little chest stuck out like a banny rooster." He said, "You man of Judea." You that dwell in Jerusalem, I scared of you a while ago. I'm not now. <laughs> Let this be known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk like you suppose it is, but this is that. Amen. We hope this is that. 
We believe this is that. He said, this is that. That was spoke of by the prophet Joel. Hallelujah. Nothing uncertain about it. This is that. That was spoke of by the prophet Joel. Oh, my. Jesus said in Mark 16, commission his church. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel. These signs perhaps ought to. <laughs> they will once in a while, maybe. <laughs> they shall accompany those that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. <laughs> if they take up serpent or drink deadly thing, you wouldn't harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Glory to God. Not maybe, they shall. These signs shall follow them that believe. Let me sum it up in saying this, brother, sister, for the next few minutes. I believe it. I believe that everything else, anything that's contrary to that is not right. I believe everything that's against that will fall. I believe I don't care how many communisms or how many uh, these isms and that ism and churchism and Romanism and all other Americanisms and everything else will fall, but that word will stand eternally. Because it is a word, and before it was a word, it has to be a thought, and a word is a thought expressed. And God in eternity it come into His mind, He expressed His thoughts and it become a word, and the word has to be made manifest. That's the reason when he spoke of a Messiah, there had to come a Messiah. He spoke that there would be a church in the last days without a spot or wrinkle on it. There will be a church there. Yeah. Hallelujah. God. He said it. I take his word. I believe it. I believe that he promised the Holy Ghost to every believer that would believe. I believe Peter on the day of Pentecost when he preached that notable sermon and told them all to repent and be baptized. And these signs would come. And this, and whoever called upon the name of the Lord would be saved. I believe that is the truth. Amen. I stood on it. I've seen it manifested. I know I'm battling at it. And I know I'm trying to make a footstep. Before I make a footstep, I have to cut loose every tangled green briar, everything else to get it out of the way. But every time you make a step, you're advancing forward. Amen. Just take the knife and cut it. Many of you remember Paul Rader. Very precious friend. I was just a boy preacher, kid. I used to go to Fort Wayne listening to him at the Rager Tabernacle. Great big fella. You get way back. Pull up his trousers. Raise up his hand and growl like a bear. And I think he will jump to the pulpit. when he, And you start with a text, yeah. At Genesis and wind up in Revelations. <laughs> All back and forth. Paul was quite a man. Talking one day, he said, I used to be a logger up in Oregon where he come from. said, one day, you know, he said, I, I just I was in the mission fields, way over somewhere, forgetting how work was at. And he was doing missionary work. He believed in God, believed in divine healing. And Paul said right here at the where the world church stands today. He said, if I would have sold my message of grace to the red-hot Pentecostals instead of doing what I've done here with you bunch, said and called myself to a weary and called to a place of thousands, sometimes thousands of dollars of debt, I've worried myself to have got a cancer and dying now. If I have sold my message of grace to the red-hot Pentecostals, God would have blessed me abundantly for it. Right? He said he was down there in the, in the jungles. And... He got blackwater fever or something. It was terrible. And he's way back out into the jungles and a firm believer in divine healing. And he said, he got sicker and sicker. He prayed and prayed. And some of the missionaries said, they just go take a boat and go get a doctor. Well, it take them days to get a doctor. And he said, I, I, I don't do that. Just let it alone. He said, if God don't heal me, then I'm coming home. So he said, his wife stayed in the room with him. He kept getting darker and darker. And said he called his wife and said, Honey, take hold my hand. Said, just keep praying for him. It's getting dark now. Said, I, I believe the shadows are falling around me. He said, hold, just hold my hand and pray while I go out. He braced himself to meet God. And he just kind of fell into a trance. And he said he dreamed that he was back over here in Oregon again as a young man cutting timber. And said the boss of the camp said, Paul, go up here on a certain side of the hill and Fell a certain tree, certain size. He said he ran up the hill with his youthful legs and knocked the tree down, and trimmed it up, 
stuck the axe down. He said, how that soft pine, this sharp, big, double-bitted axe went into the pine so nice. And said he got a hold of it and thought, well, I'll just pack it down the hill. Good, strong man that I used to train how to put my knees together and pick up with my back the biggest part of a man. His muscles is in his back, his shoulders, and the back of his legs. Said I'd pick up a big log, lay it on his shoulder, walk away. But said, that was just an ordinary log. But said, I just... I'm sorry. Said, I just simply couldn't move that log. I'm sorry. He said, I just simply couldn't move that log. He said, I tussled and I tussled and I tried to pick it up and I just couldn't do it. He said, I sapped all my strength out of me. He said, I just couldn't move that log. And he said, finally, I got so weak, I just sat down against the tree and began to wipe the perspiration off. And I just all wore out. And said, after a while, I heard my boss's voice, but said, it was the sweetest voice I ever heard. And said, when I turned around, the voice said to me, Paul. And I said, yes, boss. What is it? So what you tugging at it for? He said, well, you commanded me to bring it down to the camp. And I just wore myself out with it. I just, I just can't do it, boss. He said, Paul, don't you see that stream of water running right there? I said, yes. He said, that stream comes right down to the camp. Why don't you just throw it in the water and jump on it and ride on down to the camp? I said, I never thought of that. So he just rolled it over in the water and jumped on it and said, oh, my, we get a splash of water. And jump in and he screaming the top of his voice. He said, went over the ripples and down through the water and everything, riding on this log, going down the water. I'm riding on it. I'm riding on it. He said, the first thing he come to himself, he's right out in the middle of the floor and his wife shouting with him. He said, I'm, I'm riding on it. I'm a riding on it. I'm riding on it. Brother, nations are breaking. Israel awaiting the signs that the Bible foretold. Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbered. Return, O disperse to your own. This message of God's word is the truth. Live or die, I'm riding on it. I don't, I'm not talking with it. I'm not trying to fuss about it. I'm just tucking it and I'm riding on it. Let the critics rise. I'll shoot every riffle. I'm coming into camp one of these days, riding on the word of God. Amen. I'm certain to ride there. Let us pray. Why would you toggle with your load of sin? Why would you be the condition you are, don't know where you're standing? Running from church to church and from place to place. Why don't you just pitch it in the, on the cross tonight and ride on the Word? Why don't you just take God's promise tonight and ride on out of the mess, on out into the big blue open like that, don't tussle with it. Don't worry with it. Just believe it. Accept it. It's a kingdom that cannot be moved. Right on it. If you're sick tonight, take God's promise. I'm the Lord that heals all thy diseases. How am I going to get well, Brother Branham? The doctor says I got heart trouble. I got cancer. I got this, that, ever what it is. I'm deaf, dumb, I'm blind. What, what difference does that make? Just accept God's promise and ride on it. Let's take a great big stick and drive it down here and ride on the top of it. A prayer of faith has been prayed tonight. I'm going to ride on it. The Bible said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise him up. If he has did sin, it shall be forgiven him. I'm riding on it. I believe it. If you've done wrong, if you're a wayward tonight, he that covers his sin shall not prosper. But he that will confess his sin shall have mercy. Why not confess it? Well, what must I do, Brother Bram? Confess it and then ride on it. God said so. It'll take you right away from your sin. Is that person here tonight that's never put their real trust in God for the salvation of your soul and you'd like to be remembered in prayer as we close? Would you just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I want to cast my cares. God bless you. God bless you. I want to ca God bless you, man. I want to cast my cares. God bless you, brother. God bless you back there, sir. God bless you, young lady. All right, that's right. God bless you. I want to cast my cares upon him and just ride on his promise now. I believe that he promised. He that will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Amen. Not how I feel. I was prayed for last night, Brother Bram, I don't feel any better. That don't have one thing to do with it. 
I'm not riding up on my feelings. I'm riding up on His Word. It's His promise. Brother Branham, I've been to the altar four or five times try to receive the Holy Ghost. I never got it. That don't mean one thing. Just stay right on the log. It'll bring you right straight down to the camp. In the camp of the firstborn, in the camp of the saints, you'll arrive there. Just stay on your log and scream and shout the praises of God just as hard as you can. That's the way to do it. While we got our heads bowed, you really want to ride on it, then that little thing is tickling at your heart. Would you want to come here and stand before the altar a minute and let us pray and lay hands up on you? We'd be glad for you to come. Let's take that little something and put around your heart tonight and say, you know, you're wrong. Now raise up your hand. All right? You stepped on the log, the log of his promise, the tree, the cross that was cut down. Put your arms around this cross now. Walk right up here and say, now I'm going to ride on it. Right now, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to accept it. I believe it. I'll never change. I'm going to stay right with that word until that one's confirmed. And then after that one's confirmed, I'm going to reach right over and get on another one and start riding right on, see? And word by word, step by step, you'll possess everything that God promised you. For all things are possible to him that will ride on it. Right on His promise, for it's certain to bring you to the camp. It'll bring you to the presence of God. Will you come now while we have our heads bound and ask for anyone that would want to stand at the altar just for a moment for prayer? I'm riding on it, Lord. Lord, I believe. All my doubts are buried in the fountain. Lord, I'm coming. I believe it. I'm stepping right on the Word tonight. And I'm going to believe it with all my heart. I'm taking it at your word. One precious woman stands here at the altar to, to vindicate to God that she meant business. Won't you come who had your heads bowed and your hands raised up and want to be remembered in prayer? Will you just walk up here? God bless you. Just come up. That's it. Come right up and stand here. Say, so I'm going to ride on it. God, you made the promise. Something knocked at my heart. And I'm coming right now to ride upon that. And I'm going to stay right on it till it brings me right to the camp. I'm coming right down to the camp of the saints of the Most High. God bless you. That's good. Come right on now. You who wants to ride on just the way you are, just as I am without one plea. You remember, you say, is that a tree? Yes. There was a tree cut down one time, and it was reset again on Calvary. Just jump on that tree tonight with the promises of God, the Word that was hanging on the tree. I'm riding on it. I am going to believe it with all my heart. I want to do as much as come here and shake some hands in my breath. And God bless you for your gallant stand. God bless you, my brother. My precious sister. God bless you. The Lord is with you. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Guide you over the river. Remember, as a servant of Christ, I'm responsible for the preaching of the Word. I'm responsible for my testimony. And would I stand here tonight, and a man of 55 year, 53 years old be 54 in April, and stand here and know that even this last vision, it might be my last few days on earth? I, I might leave you in a few days. I don't know what it means. Just listen to the tape and draw your own conclusion. I don't know what it means. Would I stand here in a halfway believing that it might be my last message that I'm ever preaching is right here in Phoenix and say something that was wrong and know that my destination lays out yonder and I'll be judged by my words? My brethren, let me say this to you and my sisters. You've been in the meetings. You know what the discernment and the things. And have I ever said anything to you in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? I'll ask anybody. No, sir. Around the world are thousands of visions. Never has it been. And I'll tell you the truth tonight. The blood of Jesus Christ is plenty sufficient to wipe away every stain and everything. There is a fountain filled with blood. And you're standing at it now, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The only sure thing is left on earth where sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty sins. I'm going to ask these ministers now, and brethren, if you walk out here among these people, ever who is, is that what you call ministers to pray with the people? All ministers in here then that will want, is interested in seeing souls saved, come here and stand as a prayer group where we can bind ourselves together, get away from everything else and separate ourselves. This is men and women that's sealing their destination tonight. 
by the blood of Jesus Christ, taking him at his word, riding right up into his presence on his word and say, Here I am, Lord. I have nothing to offer but myself and take me. Will you come stand with them, if you will? Anyone who wants us, come and stand. God bless you, my brethren. That's mighty fine. I like to see man that's gallant, that's interested in soul. I guess, my brethren, that's fine. Drop right around. That's good. Stand around. Let's just now, if the pianist will get to the music, if she will, let's sing this hymn. Sweetly now, sanely, reverently, we're coming not to some mythical something. We're not coming to something that's just a, a, a make-believe, but we're coming into the presence of God, the omnipotent Jehovah God, who has promised that wherever two or three are assembled in my name, there I am in their midst. Talk to him like you would your friend. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've sinned. And we're going to sing, There is a fountain that's filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stain. That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There me I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Ever since by faith I saw that stream, thy flowing wounds supplied, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Just be real little now. You're nothing. None of us are nothing. And just sincerely now, with all your hearts, just bow your hearts and heads everywhere over the building. Our Heavenly Father, I know that your words are so true. They can't fail. They are the Word of God. They are God. And you said, He that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. And these men and women under conviction, knowing that they're not right. They've walked forward tonight, Lord, to confess that they're wrong, knowing that they have been pulsated by some inward motion that, that bid them come to the fountain. And here they stand with bowed heads and hearts to drink of the waters of life freely that's been promised by God. Receive them, Father, into thy kingdom. They are yours. You said no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that the Father has given me will come to me. And it shows that God has given these to Christ for a love gift. And here they stand, Lord. No man can pluck them out of my hand. And I pray, God, that you'll secure them tonight as they stand here and give them the baptism of the Holy Ghost while they are here at the altar. May the great power of Christ so saturate their lives now. They made their confession. They come forward. You said, He that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. We know that work is being done. Now, Lord, seal them into the kingdom of promise of the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord. Pour out your Spirit upon them and fill them with the Spirit of the living God that they might be living testimonies all the days of their life to the kingdom of God. Now let the audience stand, everybody, in prayer. Now we're going to pray that these... Uh, each one of you that come up here tonight feeling that you had sin on your heart. Now there's nothing you can do but believe that. The Holy, you accept this by faith. This is faith that you accept. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that comes to me, he will receive it. He can't do nothing else because he promised it. See? Don't rest up on a sensation now. Rest up on his word. See? The word said so. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, 
everlasting life and shall not come to the judgment, but pass from death to life. The Holy Spirit is an experience of being filled and endued with power for service. But confession and receiving Christ is to have faith and make your confession and feel free that God has forgiven you of your sins. And upon the basis of His Word, He said, No man can come except my Father draws him first. See? Now, God drawed you first. And he that will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. See? You, you have received it. Only thing you have, he, he died for you. Your sins were forgiven 1,900 years ago. You just come now to accept what he did for you. See? And do you believe that he died for your sins? Will you accept him as your propitiation? In other words, you accept him as he took your sins. Will you be glad and thank him for taking your sins? You believe he did it? Then just raise up your hand and say, I believe it. He takes my sins. Amen. Takes my sins. All right. Now, you are now a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you haven't received Christian baptism, one of these men here will see to you that, that you get Christian baptism. But now, while Peter yet spake these words before they was baptized, while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. Why? They were all under expectation. Now, you're under expectation. You want something now that will seal you into the kingdom of God, something that will be real to you. you want to re don't you want to receive the Holy Ghost, every one of you? Don't you want it? Sure you do. That's your keeping power. See, they were gathered in the upper room, praying in His name. The baptized with the Holy Ghost, and power for service came. See? Oh, that's what you want now. And you can have it right now. It's for you right now. Now, brethren, walk up this, everyone now, and lay your hands up on these brethren, and pray that they receive the Holy Ghost. Walk right up, brethren. Walk right up. Now, the whole congregation, raise up your hands, now, everybody. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, fill every heart here with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. These people here that are standing and waiting for the presence and the power of God to saturate their lives.